true murder is a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer. I would also play with yes. Thank you to play with Sam. The Night Stalker. BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. Unsolved crimes, unanswered questions. Crimes are meant to be solved, but what happens when they're not? For the individuals involved, from the victims and their families to police investigators, this is the most frustrating part of all. For them, there's no resolution, no justice, no tidy boxes in which to pack away all the bits and pieces of a puzzle that finally links together. Instead, they are only left with questions that may never get answered. Chilling cold cases and unexplained mysteries. The best new true crime stories examines a fascinating assortment of unsolved murders, unsolved crimes, serial killers, and mysterious stories from around the world, from the past to the contemporary. Like the previous anthologies in the Best New True Crime Stories series, this volume contains all new and original nonfiction accounts penned by international writers from across the literary spectrum, from true crime and crime fiction to journalism. Contributors include Dean Job, Joan Renner, Kathy Pickens, Lindsay Dennis, Anya Wassenberg, and many others. Inside, you'll find a varied assortment of unsolved crimes and myst mysterious murders, murder cases to solve told by readers from around the world, like France's Valley of Hell Mystery and the story of Austria's Most Wanted. The book that we're featuring this evening is the best new true crime stories, unsolved crimes and mysteries, with my special guest editor and author, Mitzi Cerrito. Welcome to the program, and thank you very much for this interview, Mitzi Cerrito. Hi, Dan. Thanks so much for having me back on. It's always great to be on with you. It's always great to have you, and congratulations on this latest in your series. Thank you. This is actually um, book six. <laughs> wow. Yeah, incredible. Let's talk about right away, let you talk about your introduction, what you have to say in the introduction to this book before we talk about the general contents and the authors in this book. Well, actually, you know, I, the whole idea for this I think people just really like cold cases and unsolved crimes. And uh, so this, this is sort of the direction I went in with this particular book. And, you know, people, when there's questions that can't be answered, I think it kind of makes people put their little detective hats on and, and they just sort of want to um, try to understand and maybe try to solve it in their own minds or, you know, it appeals to that amateur de detective in most of us. And I, I kind of get into that in, a, in the introduction a bit. You know, the statistics with unsolved crimes, which, as we all know, are called cold cases, they just seem to increase every year, particularly in the United States. The FBI data shows that only 45% of violent crimes actually lead to arrest and prosecution. I mean, that's that's quite alarming. I mean, that yes. we're talking about a, a significant proportion of these crimes that are not solved. Actually, they're, they're saying cold cases are in a crisis situation, hence that's more alarming. And it's not just a USA problem. The UK is also having this same thing happen, and Canada as well, particularly regarding violent crimes such as murder. And, you know, despite the fact there are advanced forensics that can actually, you know, solve cold cases and have solved cold cases, we still have a significant amount of crimes that haven't been solved. So for this particular book, I just sort of got very international collection of these types of crimes from all over the world and different time time frames. You know, some of them are quite old. The likelihood of them ever being solved is probably near impossible. But some of them are not so old. And, and you know, for all I know, they may be in the process of being solved as we speak. So it's just a fascinating area and people seem to really enjoy it. Now, tell us about the contents of the book, uh, the chapter titles and the authors involved. And you have some reoccurring authors with this anthology like you have done before, and especially a few authors of note. So if there's anything of interest to note with these authors as well, please include that in the 
chapter descriptions. Sure. Uh, yeah, there are some return authors, which is always fun to work with people again and, and also fun to get in some completely new people contributing to the series. In this particular order, I shall tell you what, what's in the book. We have 25 years later, this AT lesbian double murder still haunts me. Uh, that's written by Lindsay Dannis, who's a uh, journalist and also a travel writer. The next story is The Great Montreal Museum Heist of 1972, which is by Canadian author Anya Wassenberg. We next go to The Lady Vanishes, The Mysterious Disappearance of Jean Spangler, which is by Joan Renner, who is a, is totally enamored of, of historic L.A. And so she writes a lot of stuff about Los Angeles in, in historical times and the uh, film industry that around that period. The next story is Austria's Most Wanted, 27 Years and Counting. And that's by Iris Reinbacher, who is an author based out out of Kyoto right now. She's from, I I believe she's from, I think she might be Austrian. (laughs) I'm not sure. No, German. I'm sorry. I can't recall offhand. We next go to The Curious Case of the Dogs in the Nighttime, France's Valley of Hell Mystery by Dean Job who's a, a very popular Canadian true crime writer, particularly particularly historical true crime. Uh, we Then after that, we have A Murder in Beverly Wood by Priscilla Scott Rhodes, who's an American author. This is her second contribution in the series. Then we go to The Enduring Mystery of Julia Wallace from crime writer Kathy Pickens, who's also from the States. Then we go to a returning author again. Kathy's also been in other books. We go to Deirdre Perot in A Mystery Within the Vatican's Walls. And what a mystery it is. Then we go to In a Field Outside of Edmonton from Janelle Como, a Canadian author and podcaster. And then we have me. My story is called In Heaven, Everything is Fine. I always contribute to my own books. It's the perk of being the boss. Sure. (laughs) And then The Railway Child by C.L. Raven, who has been a contributor many times over. They're actually a pair of identical twins from Wales who write together. And I I can't even imagine doing that, but it it works for them. (laughs) Yeah. And then we have Swallowed Up by the Dark. The Vanishing of Benjamin Bathurst by Kieran Conliffe. He's new to the series and he is Northern Irish writer from Belfast. We have another new person to the series, Pamela Costello, who writes When Boston Turns Its Back, and she's from the States. We have a return of David Breakspear from the UK, who is a totally a big mob person. He just loves mob history. And he wrote Neighbors at War, The Disappearance of John Favara. And then we round off with the final story, The Pipe Hayes Murders, from our returning contributor, Paul Williams, who's based in Australia. Now, you also talk, you have a section called About the Contributors, and we we mentioned that. And there are, and some people that you mentioned as well, when they talk about the, you mentioned a woman that has a blog called uh, About L.A., and so she is one of your contributing authors in this. Yeah, Joan Renner. Yeah, yes. yeah. She she writes a lot of historical stuff about Los Angeles. That's that's her thing. She she, she disappears in the bowels of downtown LA in the library and just researches and researches and researches. Yes, and she's published a book in 2016. I had my notes here, but if a book about the LA situation and all things LA in 2016. Yeah, probably that Aggie Underwood one, that might be the one. Yeah, that's the one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, your story, In Heaven, Everything is Fine. Tell us about this story. It involves filmmaker David Lynch and a man named Marvin John Nance, or Jack Nance. Tell us about this parking lot meeting and the incredible film history of this Marvin Jock John, Jack Nance. Yeah, well, you know, people might, if I say eraser head, that may trigger some recognition in people's minds. It's been a film, I, I know this is digressing a little bit, it's been one of those films that I saw it and I've never forgotten it. And I've made references to it countless times in my life. And when I was trying to find a story that I would write myself, I just came upon this one. And I had no idea Jack Nance was dead. And that just totally threw me. 
because I just totally loved Eraserhead. Now, he's actually the gentleman who plays the, the lead character. And that was a, a student film, actually, when, when David Lynch was going to film school. And he was casting for this student film. And Jack Nance went and he got the part. And it's, it's a totally, as, as one would expect from David Lynch, it's a very bizarre film. I probably, I think it has to be one of the most bizarre things he's ever done. I don't think he's ever topped it. And, and the whole story of Jack Nance is, is like a Lynchian film. It's totally bizarre as well. What happened was, Apparently, he went, he was living in South Pasadena at at the time. This is when he was in his 50s already. And his career was kind of on its way out, you know, which we all go into a bit about why. But he went, it was a Sunday morning, five o'clock in the morning, apparently. And he goes to walk over to his local Winchell's Donuts at one of those strip shopping centers uh, that we see all over Los Angeles County. And apparently he got into some sort of altercation with two young Hispanic males who were just hanging around. And I guess their mere presence offended him so much that he just sort of started a verbal thing with them. And, you know, these are two fit young men and there's Jack and he's not in good shape, you know, years of alcohol abuse and probably not a great diet and probably no exercise. You know, they they pretty much, he ends up on the floor, uh, black eye, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, later that day, he meets up with a couple of good friends of his, also people in the film industry. And, you know, they, they can't help but notice he's rather battered looking. He's got a black eye and he's complaining of a headache. So he regales them with this incident that happened outside Winchell's where he just sort of told these two guys off that, you know, and got a bit of a beating for it, but he still made himself out like he was the winner. So so as I said, he's complaining. He's not feeling so great. He goes home. So the next day, one of his one of the friends from lunch thinks he better go check on Jack, see how he's doing. And he finds him dead on the floor. Now, because of the whole thing with this altercation outside Winchell's and the and the beating, it's it's the police conclude that it, it is possible possible murder here, you know, his, if he's died, died as a result of these injuries. So whole investigation opens up, you know, everybody's involved. They're all, everybody's trying to find out what happened to Winchell's. They're looking for uh, witnesses. I mean, I mean, you have plate glass windows that face the parking lot. So surely someone would have seen this fight, but no one's seen this fight. There is no, no one has witnessed a fight. There's no reports of any fight. Even his friend went to investigate on his own and there's just no sign of any kind of a fight. So how did Jack Nance die? What did he die from? And and this is pretty much the mystery in the story because it's never concluded what, what killed him, but something killed him. You mentioned that he maybe had been offended by these two Hispanic gentlemen that he later talks about to his friends, but why would be he be offended? What was sort of his reputation? And was his death at the hands of these two guys and this altercation understandable to people like David Lynch and people like that were his friends? Well, you know, apparently these guys, you know, it's five o'clock in the morning and these two guys are just hanging around. So I guess, I guess Lynch just sort I'm sorry, not Lynch. Jack Nance just sort of saw him them as slackers, you know, just a bunch of, you know, a couple of, you know, no good guys, just why don't you go kind of get a job sort of thing. So, you know, apparently he he was a bit of a testy character, Jack Nance, and he wasn't averse to, um, you know, telling people off and flying off the handle. And so it was sort of in character for him to probably pick a fight in a way, even if it was a fight he couldn't conceivably win. So that's really it. I mean, he just sort of laid into these guys and he kind of even admitted to his friends, well, I got what I deserved, I guess, for, you know, some of the things that I said. But, you know, on the other hand, he was he was a drinker. He he had a major alcohol problem. And by the time this actually happened, it was probably the worst he's, he'd ever been with his alcohol abuse. And actually, at the time of his death, his alcohol uh, was something like 0.25, which is very high. I mean, if you get any higher than that, you could probably be pretty much be comatose. So yeah, that probably, you know, added to the whole thing. And given that with police and also the they were hampered by finding any witnesses and any location of these supposed alleged assailants. So <laughs> yeah, the case really did go cold and unsolved, didn't it? 
Well, yeah. And actually, they even had like a star detective working on it. Uh, Jerry, um, oh, I can't think of his name offhand, but he's pretty much like a celebrity cop in LA. He's done film consulting and even had himself portrayed in a film. So, I mean, they were just saying like, well, what's going on? I mean, is there even a case at all? Because we can't find any evidence that there was any kind of a altercation or anything. You know, was he murdered? And Because it just sounds like he wasn't murdered. Maybe it was some other kind of way he died. And, you know, if you really look at the fact about his heavy drinking and his blood alcohol content, maybe he made this up. And, and that's the interesting thing, because he did have a reputation of telling tales. He enjoyed his storytelling and he would embellish on things a lot. So it's not outside the bounds of reality that he may have invented this story. And I'm sort of thinking that perhaps he drank so much he fell over and, you know, hit his head and died as a result of that. And, you know, and it was a matter of embarrassment that he didn't want to admit to his friends that he perhaps got these injuries falling over drunk. Maybe yeah. he just made this story up as sort of saving face type of a thing. Who knows? It's very interesting, too, that the research you did for this, you found out the inextricable link between David Lynch and uh, Jack Nance in terms of the yeah, eraser head was the only leading role. So you talked about his drinking, which impaired his ability to show up and stay employed gainfully in the film business eventually. But also that David Lynch even, I think, commented, or someone commented, he wasn't the most ambitious actor. <laughs> However, David Lynch used him in numerous projects, didn't he? Yes, he did. I mean, he actually, they they were they were colleagues and they were friends for, I believe, 25 years. I mean, they were, they had a very, yes, if you really think about it, if Lynch put up with him with all of his, you know, drinking and his, his, erratic behavior and sometimes, you know, just because a lot of people were just getting fed up with him. And uh, that's why I said why his career was just going downhill so quickly, especially toward the end. They just didn't want to work with him anymore. It was just not worth it. But, you know, Lynch did give him an awful lot of work. And I think, you know, he was genuinely sad and devastated when, when Nance died. But I mean, there's just so many bizarre things things in this entire case. I mean, that's why I said it's like the, the case itself, the situation itself is like a David Lynch film, if, if Lynch would have made a film of this. I mean, just to give you an example, Jack Nance was also in the Twin Peaks TV series, which you probably know. Mm -hmm. And do you recall there was a backward speaking man in that yes. series? Yes. Okay. Well, apparently the backward speaking man went on a Facebook rant and said that David Lynch had Nance killed. I mean, completely insane things connected to this case that just, just make it the most bizarre case ever, you know? Absolutely. Let's talk about a more serious case. That's murder. Not that murder is not serious or <laughs> death is not serious, but this is the curious case case of the dogs in the nighttime, Francis Valley of Hell mystery that we talked about in the synopsis, Dean Job. And this is April 26, 1929 in Western Province, Provence. And a woman in night clothes is found floating in a water tank behind her villa, a bullet hole in her head and a revolver, hers, at the bottom of the cistern, one shot fired. Her name was Olive Branson. Tell us a little bit about Olive Branson. She's a wealthy English, English artist. And what police think happened, as well as the doctor that examines her. Yeah, that's a, that's a bizarre one. I mean, just to, just to kind of the name Branson, if anybody's tweaked to that, she was actually related to Sir Richard Branson. Yes. So that's a rather interesting connection right there. But Olive Branson was an artist. She was from England and she moved to Provence and she was a lady in her late 40s. And she was a bit of a bohemian. You know, she'd been married. She'd been married to some military man and that didn't quite work out. I mean, it was just a too pedestrian for her. She was a free spirit, bohemian. She, when she lived in England, she would go off to the Romani camps and would paint the Rome, Roma. She, she was not someone who was, was wanted to be confined by, by society's rules. And I, and in many ways that sort of backfired on her when this case was out because she was almost blamed for her own demise and criticized for her lifestyle choices. So anyway, she, she moved to Provence. She bought a villa and 
by all intents and purposes, seemed to be very happy there. She even invested in a hotel in the local village. And the son of the gentleman who was managing the hotel was considerably younger than her. And they ended up in a relationship, which again, she was heavily criticized for because, you know, how scandalous for an older woman to be with a younger man, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, so not that, you know, anything's changed, but um, anyway, so she's found dead in the cistern in the water. And so the first thought, well, the first investigator is saying that it was suicide. So all these stories were coming up that, oh, you know, perhaps she thought that her young lover was going to leave her and she committed suicide. But, you know, there was just, it didn't match up. I mean, if she walked from the house to the cistern, her stockings, you know, the the feet of her stockings should show some sort of, you know, tears or runs. And there was nothing like that. So another investigator came on board who... uh, is described in a, in a way as a sort of a Columbo, mm. you know, very, very, you know, he doesn't just go with the superficial things. He's, he digs, digs, digs into everything. And so he really said this, this was a murder. She was carried out of the house and put in the cistern and pretty much shot execution style to the forehead. It just did not seem likely that a suicide could be somebody would put a, you know, put a gun to her own head like that, yes. shoot herself. And there's no sign of any damage on her stockings from walking across the gravel. Mm. And there was also blood found, you know, little spots of blood found. And that seemed to really lend credence to the fact that this was a murder. But, you know, obviously you can figure out who's the first suspect, the young lover. And this wasn't helped by the fact that Olive had apparently told him that when I die, you will get the hotel, so do not worry. (laughs) You know, that's sort of like you're kind of, you know, giving somebody a good excuse to off you if if that's what they want to do. So that kind of, you know, made him the number one suspect. And there was actually a trial. And he was not convicted. So it's one of those things like, you know, there's still a school of thought that maybe she did commit suicide, even though that there's no logical way she could have got herself into the cistern without showing evidence of that. Maybe it was a spite suicide, you know, just to implicate her lover if she, if she perceived him to be leaving her. Or he was, or she was murdered and maybe he really did it or someone else did it. So it's, it's, Very odd story, and there's just no resolution to it. It's very interesting that one of the stranger aspects of this is that she had four dogs, Olive, and no one reported that those dogs were barking. Exactly, exactly. That's that's one reason why uh, the young lover, Pinay, was zeroed in on, because the dogs would know him because he'd been at the house so many times, whereas if it were a stranger, the dogs would have been freaking out barking. So it's just... Unless it was someone else, the dogs knew. <laughs> and it's as the jokingly saying in the story, well, we can't put the dogs on the witness stand. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, is though this this uh, inspector, Gubel, he was very adamant and very dedicated and persistent with this. And it's very interesting to trial too. Unlike American trials, the, the French magistrate, the French judge acts like a prosecutor in very many ways cross-examining the defendant. So unlike the U.S. in that regard, and there was a lot of circumstantial evidence, but it was not enough for the jury to convict. Yes. But however, but this Gubel, there is an incredible vivid scene in this story where he takes this Panay and takes him back to the home of all of Branson. And when the police officer comes out of the car, the dogs bark, the four dogs bark appropriately, accordingly. And yet when they see Panay, they are silent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one thing that I really take away from me from this story is is the way in which Olive is sort of found to be a participant in her own death, again, because of her lifestyle choice, her, her bohemian lifestyle, her you know, having a young lover, not wanting to conform to what society says she should be, particularly at this particular time in, in history. And and that's something that crops up again and again and again in the book when it's a female victim. Somehow there is some, you know, they're trying to find a way to blame her for her own demise. And 
you know, that standard. And, you know, it just, it's just a theme that keeps cropping up and you can't ignore it after you've read, read a few stories. Yeah, you write that the media really did try and convict her in this whole thing because of her lifestyle and any kind of innuendo and rumor was published. And irresponsibly. Yeah. And and there was stories all over the all over the world. I mean, the stories were, you know, the being written about in the United States. And again, it was that whole sort of disparaging type of um attitude toward Olive, you know, like how how dare she be the way she is and she was sort of a loose woman kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah, there was other other evidence that pointed to Panay as well, because he had really hidden the idea or the fact that he would inherit this bar or this hotel, pardon me. So there was real, definitely a motive that could be seen in this. Police, though, took a rejection letter that she received that day from, because she was a very serious artist. Yes, yes. Uh, from, from, a, from a gallery that was not, in London gallery that was not going to uh, exhibit a painting that she had submitted. And they used, police used that as premise that that would be enough to spur her to commit suicide. But I, I thought just reading that, that I know artists personally and they get used to rejection <laughs> without suicide. Yes. You get a thick skin. Yeah, you get a thick skin. Same for writers. It's just like if we all commit suicide, every time there's a rejection, there'd be no one writing, no one painting, no one doing anything. <laughs> yeah. And this uh, valley of hell mystery really, uh, you say, inspired at least one work of fiction, a book or movie called Murder Aboard. And uh, the St. Louis Dispatch predicted in 1929 that the secret of all of Branson's death will never be known. <laughs> they, they nailed it, I guess. Absolutely. Now, another story in this incredible anthology, we mentioned C.L. Raven, the identical twin writers that are very interested in horror. They have a very, very interesting website, and they've been involved in movies, movie making, horror writing, and all things horror. So very, very interesting. I think people should check that out. The, the story, The Railway Child, September 3rd, 1939, this is set in, and Britain declares war on Germany. And blackouts and air raids and sirens and kids walking home, gas masks, is common. These blackouts are where people are encouraged, the street lights are out, the traffic lights are out, people's homes are, they're encouraged to black out the windows on their homes to be able to not have the enemy see homes and potential targets. So this blackout was from 1939, I believe, uh, was in place um, and, and factors into this story greatly. And there was a little girl and this from the Cox family, um, this was a little village in Whitchurch, uh, not yet a suburb of Cardiff. And you write that in Wales, they were removed from Britain. And some people didn't even think there was much to this war and didn't take it so seriously. But tell us a little bit about Private Arthur James Cox. Uh, they called him Jim, his wife, Irene, and their kids, Dennis, seven years old and Joyce, four years old. What happens one day when they go for school, when they leave for school? Yeah, well, this is a, you know, just a pretty typical family. You know, a father was away with the regiment. His, his wife, Irene, you know, she was a homemaker and looked after the children. And so Joyce, Joyce, who is the little girl who's murdered, she's four years old and she has an older brother, Dennis, who's seven. And so, you know, even though we're we're in 1939 and, and every, you know, children are commonly walking around with gas masks. That's just the way it was. And, and so, you know, it became routine. So the children were walking home from school as they normally would do. And they all take the same route. And if they ever diverged from that, it would use, usually be to perhaps visit the grandmother. So on this particular day, they were accompanied by a cousin and they decided that they were going to go to the cousin's house first before going home. So apparently what happened was little Joyce was sort of lagging behind and the boys just, you know, being boys, they just got annoyed and they just sort of went on ahead. Well, that was it. Joyce vanished. And so later on, when her mother was getting concerned and checking about what, you know, where's Joyce already? She should have been home. It's, it's a short walk, it's, you know, a few minutes. No one knew where Joyce was. 
it, she just literally disappeared off the street. So searches were implemented. Uh, people were being questioned left and right. Has anyone seen her? They actually ended up with significantly large number of people out hunting around trying to find Joyce. And sadly, one gentleman who had a daughter around her age, you know, wanted to help. And he and his dog went and joined the search. And the dog found Joyce's dead body. Um, apparently, she'd been, she hadn't been murdered where she was found, but she was dumped in this railway cutting. And in the first instance, her underclothes were missing. And then they were found later on torn up. It was just a really sad outcome because her father, when he had first heard about Joyce being missing, he he had, you know, tried to get leave and he was on his way home. Right. And it was too late. She was already found by then. So it's just a, a strange story because there's all kinds of strange tales. And I suppose when you have children who are witnesses and you ask children, you know, you may get all kinds of crazy answers. And I mean, there were stories of like a strange older man with a black suit and a cap, some other, you know, type of man being seen. There were other stories, for instance, even a local policeman was seen with a with a wheelbarrow in a sack in the wheelbarrow that it could have been a sack that could have held a young child. But on the other hand, there was an allotment nearby. So having a wheelbarrow in the vicinity of, a, of an allotment is not unusual at all. So one of the interesting things about the story is that this is in the area where the writers actually live. And they have they go walking with their dogs in this area. So it's sort of one of these things that hits home for them. And I think that's why they decided they wanted to pursue this story and write about it. So the sad thing is that they try to find out information on their own because here we are so many years later and there's just still things that are not being released. And I mean, we're talking, you know, this was 1939 and there were just mysterious things found like a, like a, like a packet, like a newspaper with a strange quote. No, one, no one's ever said what the quote was that was penciled on this newspaper and yet it's being held at the National Archives. <laughs> All these things, it's as if the case is never going to be solved because no one wants to give out information to let it be solved. The lead about the ex-retired police officer, they did go and examine the usual suspects and other suspects, but they really didn't have much to go on. Kathleen, which was related to Irene, Joyce's mother, was a good witness, it seems, from what I read, and said that she had seen this retired police officer with this wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow with a sack. And you write that it wouldn't be unusual because there was these allotment gardens for somebody to have a wheelbarrow, but it also was a perfect getaway and instrument to deliver a body or transport a body in this no-car area. Now, this retired police officer was investigated. And what's very interesting, when I mentioned the blackout earlier in this story and why it's important is that at that time, the blackout order was in effect. And that night at 6.57, that blackout would have occurred. Again, really good cover for a killer. Yeah, exactly. And and the idea that the 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 forensics that were were conducted the the doctor that examined her uh what she had eaten what she had eaten she was found to have been taken to a home and so the she was dumped at that crime scene but she was at a home she was fed in fact they could say what she was fed and that included blackberries so she was held at this home for whatever reason and then maybe under the cover of night transported to this dump site. Yeah, and that's actually even more sinister because it kind of gives the impression that she may have known who this person was if she felt, yes. you know, if she's sitting in the kitchen and eating food there. I mean, obviously, if, if the child is really agitated and frightened, they, they can't eat as any of us wouldn't be able to eat under those circumstances. But if she's comfortable and she's eating a meal, it just sort of Im implies that she must have known who this person was or trusted who this person was, which kind of goes back again with the authors saying about if it were a policeman, a child would trust a policeman. You know, they, they wouldn't think twice about, you know, if the policeman said, well, here, come on back to my house and let's have something to eat, they wouldn't be concerned. In 1939, they wouldn't be concerned about that. So it makes it even more horrific that it was perhaps not even a random killing, but it, someone was stalking her with the intention of killing her. Yes, and she was manually strangled and, and little Joyce had a condition, a lymphoid 
uh, condition, which she would be susceptible to shock. So the cause of death was actually shock and strangulation. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, as I said, you know, CL Raven, they were they were researching and trying to get information released and applying for records. And they just kept running into brick walls and all these tests that are done as far as if we can release this information, is it in public interest to do it? Or is this going to impact on someone's privacy? It was like a whole catch-22 situation for them to try to get more information about, you know, what's what's being held, what's been said. And uh, ultimately, by the time anything is actually completely released, there won't be anyone left alive, even remotely connected to Joyce. Yes, it's very interesting, this story, very unique in terms of this freedom of information was also done by the family. And and now it's the relatives of Joyce's family because none of those people are alive. So it's the relatives carrying on this. And they pursued it after they discovered the files in the natural and in London's Metro uh, or pardon me, in the National Archives. But at the same time, the Met what their response was that they closed, that uh, they they not open to the public after that. So they sealed those reports. So in 2015, this is Joyce's family pursuing this. And there were some statements made that alluded to that the police officer, the retired police officer, one of the suspects. And it seemed that this was part of the initiative to not have this case open for 100 years, they made a stipulation that this case would not be open for 100 years under the sort of a typical mantra of, well, this is still an open investigation and, and some of the stuff is, is not accurate. And basically, we don't want to accuse people that we can't prove of something as heinous as murder. But it seems that the retired police officer weighs into this very, very heavily. And 2040 before that anyone can get this incredible information. And you write that, and CL Raven uh, writes that uh, that this information is also includes DNA potentially because of the tobacco pouch and the newspaper. So very, very interesting, this development 100 years before we can find out the truth. Yeah, well, and interestingly enough, too, the the retired police officer died. He, you know, he's already dead, too. So it's, uh, I think what's telling, and, and even though they, like the South Wales police are saying that, you know, nothing is ever closed. It's a cold case, but we, we don't give up. By the time everything's released, it's just highly unlikely they're going to devote resources to solving the case, especially C.L. Raven right at the end that, you know, if everyone's already dead, it's just not likely. You know, the, that kind of the financial, you know, burden of that. Right. You you have a, also a story in a field outside of Edmonton. You mentioned Janelle Camo. We won't go into that story because it involves so many characters and so many murders. But we spoke beforehand or we contacted each other beforehand. Maybe you can discuss really essentially what that story is about and what it concerns. What is the central issue there? Sure. Well, you know, this is... um. It's, un- this, it's, it's something that really is is an epidemic. Um, it's an epidemic in Canada and it's an epidemic in the United States and people just are not that aware of it. But it's about missing and murdered Indigenous women. In this particular story, this is in the Edmonton, Alberta area where for decades women are just vanishing. Some are found dead, some are not found at all. Now, Janelle kind of creates this whole pattern here and, and the whole list of, of all the women who have been found either dead or are still not found. And the list is, as she says at the end of the story, it'll probably have more names added to it even by the time this is published. But I think I think the, the sad thing here is just the lack of resources devoted to even finding these women or solving their, their murders. Now, a lot of these these first first nations women and a lot of them were sex workers a lot of them had substance abuse problems and it's as if all these things combined tend to make them less and less and less important when it came to actually solving what happened to them i mean there's one reference in the story about how the one of the missing women's mother who's just very concerned already because you know whether her daughter's a sex worker whether her daughter has had a drug problem she's not someone who just 
vanishes off the face of the earth without telling you where she's going. Right. And she's at the police station and they don't even want to take a report. They're not even like bothered. Yeah. And she just hounds and hounds and hounds them. And then finally somebody takes the report and then she says, okay, great. Well, now what happens? And basically she's told, well, we wait for a body to turn up. And that's just sort of the whole attitude throughout. Uh, there's just not a lot of you know, importance on these cases. And that's sort of the same thing that we saw happen with the Picton case in British Columbia as well, with all those women disappearing at, at, at the Picton's farm. Just was not a lot of resources devoted to it. And this is, this is a big problem with, with Indigenous women who are being murdered or just disappearing off the streets. And as I said, it's happening in the United States as well. And it is proportionally, the amount of these women who have this happen is is completely out of whack with what the statistics should be in general for women. So clearly there's a problem. One interesting aside, when, when um, I was doing fact-checking, that's one of my wonderful jobs as well when, when the book is being done is to check everyone's facts as best as I can. I was going to Janelle and I'm saying, listen, don't we have a date for when these women disappeared or don't we have this date or some sort of better information. The, the record taking was just so sloppy and so careless that they didn't even, the police didn't even have the correct information. They just didn't bother putting down the correct information. So that, that also is not helping in an investigation when you don't have proper information being recorded. Absolutely. To be fair, though, you also mentioned this in another story in this book, that what people don't realize, because the police are criticized as, as especially when a serial killer is running rampant, will solve the case, stop the stem of murders. But a stranger murder is particularly hard to solve. And what I found in Winnipeg was in a particular case of a serial killer named Dean Lamb, was that he had confessed to the murder of three, again, uh, people working in the sex trade, three prostitutes he claimed to have killed. While he was in prison, he he said, "I will, if you give me $1,500, I will tell you the fate of these three women. So he told the story that each time he was on crack, doing crack with these women, he got angry and killed them. So they, he gave a description where the two bodies were disposed of, and the police subsequently found those bodies. The third body could not be found. And he said, I threw them in the dumpster. So they knew the approximate date and the dumpster and went to the dump. The indigenous women involved, the parents, it's understandable, they complained and they wanted the police to pursue this, despite not being able to find her remains. And so they spent one million, you talk about resources, they spent one million dollars to dig up that dump to no avail. And then when they went to court, because there was no proof of the third death, despite his confession, wow. that murder didn't count. That murder was not, a, didn't count. But now let's add another layer of injustice. There are no consecutive sentences for murder in Canada. And for a few years there was, and now it's been overturned. So multiple murder. The most anyone can get is 25 years before eligibility of parole. And then they'll be due, they'll be entitled to that parole hearing. And the families will have the right to attend and disagree and oppose the, each and every one of those quite regular parole hearings afterwards. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about resources, how can you find a person when you have no leads? They, they might jump into a car without anyone knowing that they jumped into that car. They might not have regular cell phone contact. And you can know that there are some people that are prejudiced in all walks of life, and the police are no exception. And But I think that comes to priority. When someone sees a family that's unified and horrified and knows where their loved one was and should be, and some of these cases are the most innocent people imaginable, it's heart-wrenching. And those detectives can't solve those cases of stranger abduction. So I'm saying that there is at least some reasonable explanation for to at least counter some of the criticism. But again, sloppily kept records and telling people don't worry about it and disparaging mar remarks about their loved ones that are missing is also rampant and very, very common. Well, that's absolutely true. And I think we see also time and again when especially why sex works or sex workers are such great targets for, for murder and serial murder is because there just seems to be, they're, they're just easy victims. 
And and clearly these women were easy victims. You know, they, they were sex workers if they had drug abuse problems. And again, being First Nations women, and they're just easy targets. And but but as you read through the story, it's it's just amazing that the the amount of these women that this has happened to, and specifically in this particular region. And Janelle mentions in the story too, just sort of paints a picture of just how remote it is up there in Edmonton. I mean, there's just, once you leave Edmonton, there's just nothing, 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 nothing. And then you run into British Columbia, nothing, nothing, nothing until you finally get to Vancouver. And it's just a, a perfect area for, for dumping people. Yes, absolutely. I want to thank you very much, Mitzi, for coming on and talking about your latest, The Best New True Crime Stories, Unsolved Crimes and Mysteries. Tell us about how people might find out more about this. Is there a website, Facebook page, social media? Tell us more about when it's going to be released. Well, actually, it just came out, I'm trying to think, just about a couple of weeks ago. So it's it's pretty much uh, hot off the press. Ah, uh, And it's available in print and digital and available pretty much everywhere, Amazon. Um, chapters Indigo, if you're in Canada, it's, it's any bricks and mortar bookstores, online bookstores, different formats, Kobo, Nook Reader, Kindle Reader. And I can find out more information at my website, mitzisoretto.com. And I also maintain a Twitter presence, a uh, Facebook presence, an Instagram presence. And I recently went to the dark side and I now have a TikTok <laughs> presence. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Yes, fantastic. Thank you so much, Mitzi Serrato. The best new true crime stories, unsolved crimes and mysteries. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Mitzi Serrato. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night.